This is How About That Podcast, a show dedicated to all things Dallas Cowboys. With both objective and subjective perspectives, How About That Podcast is your place to hear about America's team. Now, here's Joseph Hoyt and Danny Morales. Joey, I want to start off slow and calm, you know, breathing in with that new nose being, you know, goose fraba, you know, if you've ever seen anger management, quiet, because to be honest with you, Joey, I'm fed up. See what I did there? (laughs) I do want to ask you super, super fast nose with the surgery. (laughs) <laughs> is, is the difference night and day? I feel like we haven't yeah. had a nose checking in a while. Yeah, no, I'm glad, I'm glad we're checking on the nose. Yeah, no, it's it's great, man. I Anyone who has a deviated septum slash, um, you know, you can't breathe out of your nose well, you have chronic chronic sinus infection, that ended up being the real kicker for me in addition to breathing. But if these things plaguing you, I highly recommend consulting an ear, nose, and throat doctor. If you're in the Dallas area, Dr. Presley Mock in Dallas was fantastic. Um, fix me right up. I feel amazing. Um, yeah, I'm running like it's, I'm running farther, like longer than I've ever had because like things that I usually hit like a wall at a certain point and I was like, Oh, I just don't have stamina. I just don't think I was breathing. So now I'm like running more and more and actually progressing. The goal is to run like some kind of five. I've never run a 5k or anything Mm -hmm. like that. So to do something like that in the next calendar year. So, uh, or next year, I would, I always say calendar year. You know when people say the term, it means by December 31st of this year? Yeah. Yeah, not like a year, a whole year? Yeah. Okay, see, I didn't know that until <laughs> like a year ago. Um, so I'm trying to... A calendar year ago or a regular year ago? A regular year ago. <laughs> <laughs> not January 1st. Um, but yeah, no, I'm doing well. Um, but I'm also just annoyed, Joey, and frustrated because... And this is this isn't if this is your first time listening to a podcast. This isn't the first time I've talked about it. But the media cycle in today's world bothers me for multiple reasons. But the main reason is what determines what news is in today's world, right? What determines what we're talking about on a daily basis? We're in the off season right now. It's slow. So in today's world, people have to get creative with how they get engagement. We've talked a lot about some of these accounts on social media that kind of are just they're they're lions searching for prey right and the prey is like little news nuggets that they can turn into their dinner aka engagement clicks which then actually literally pays them now especially on twitter if you're verified you get paid for engagement so there's there's an interest in finding these little nuggets and turning into the in, in the news right which is not necessarily the big problem here it's kind of the fact that that determines what news is now it's it used to be you know what what determines what we're talking about right it it was newspapers writing things columnists and i guess it's kind of similar but i think the the motivation is different these days so for example the reason i said i'm fed up <laughs> to start the podcast is because in the last week a report quote unquote came out from and this is not Ty Dunn's fault because Ty Dunn does an incredible job with his go long um, stuff. You should subscribe. He's an incredible, incredible feature and investigative sports writer. But he wrote a piece back on June third, I believe. So mind you, we're now three weeks away from June third, talking about the Cowboys. What's gone wrong with the Cowboys? Why are the Cowboys perennial, you know, front runners in the front in the in the regular season who then disappointed in in, in the postseason. Why have they not gone to an NFC Championship game in 30 years? And there's a lot of information in that story, Joey. But recently, aggregate accounts who, mind you, present incorrect information constantly, or they take information, put their own spin on it to try and increase engagement for monetary purposes. They, they, this week, it, one of them, one of the accounts first did it. And then when one account does it, it's like a flame, like a moth to flame because everyone does it, all these aggregate accounts. Basically, the quote report was that Mike McCarthy is fed up with Jerry Jones. That's what the, the quote was, right? Here is the quote from the story from Ty Dunn. And Ty Dunn in the story is quoting a former Cowboys personnel man. The former Cowboys personnel man says, quote, 
Mike McCarthy is doing the best he can. Some of the people I've talked to have said he's getting fed up with it a little bit in terms of navigating the relationship between being a head coach of the Dallas Cowboys and the head coach for owner Jerry Jones. It's hard. I feel bad for Dak. I think Dak's a really good quarterback who's capable of taking the team to the Super Bowl. He's got to overcome a lot of things. So that's one line in a story, and it's kind of hitting on an idea that we all know, Joey, that Jerry Jones is a lot. <laughs> Jerry Jones talks more than any owner in the NFL. He's recently, you know, he's so tied up with the, the head of the NFL. He directs a lot of business for the NFL, a lot of things. Long story short, You'd have to live under a rock to think that Jerry Jones is not a lot to deal with, right? And to be honest with you, it wouldn't be shocking that Mike McCarthy, in a year where he is now on a prove-it deal, a one-year prove-it deal, where he, he is being kind of the poster child for like, hey, if you don't get it done, if this Cowboys team doesn't get it done, you're gone. And not only, Mike, are you gone, but your entire coaching staff is gone, who's got wives and families on one-year deals. So, I mean, even Mike McCarthy, Joey, has talked about how uncomfortable that is. Naturally, to be it's in human nature to be uncomfortable. To be honest with you, if I was on a one year prove it deal where I had <laughs> the likes of a hundred other people that depended on me to do well, and there was a guy who was kind of directing that, quote, I'd be a little fed up too. So, my big point being because the thing that bothers me is these aggregate accounts present this information in a way that that goes viral. It's now become a talking point for the human population, which means now you have to have Skip Bayless talking about it. You have to have national heads talking about it because it's news now. A a little one quote from a former personnel man in a story from June 3rd, three weeks later is news in something, to be honest with you, Joey, we all know. So I'm fed up with just being this fed up story because it's, in my opinion, It's a perfect example of why the media cycle is so wrong these days because the motivation is different than it used to be for things determining the media cycle. All right. That's my rant to start off the pod about five minutes. That was my homily. Joey, what do you think about the fed up story about my take? You inferred to it, I think, closer to the beginning of your of your monologue, so to speak, um, <laughs> <laughs> is the fact that it's just that time of the year where there's no OTAs, no mini camp, no training camp. So like you said, with the moth going to the light, like they just like any little thing they can do, especially when it's about the Dallas Cowboys who Stephen A and Skip and all those people like to talk about as much as they possibly can. I think it's just a matter of of that. It's just them being like, we have literally nothing else of real substance to talk about. So let's find this little quote and make it into a whole big topic and it'll kill time. It'll be interesting. And people will kind of be like, whoa, Mike McCarthy's fed up. And like you said, like, of course he's fed up. I mean, or even like a little, and it wasn't like he's, they straight up said in the quote, McCarthy's fed up. It said, some people say he might be fed up a little, whatever it was. One, yeah, one former personnel guy told Ty on this, which, <laughs> to be honest, that former personnel guy might be best friends with Mike McCarthy, right? Yeah. Shoot, it might be Mike McCarthy. And then, you know what I mean? Like, there's, we don't, it's an anonymous quote, right? But Ty Dunn, this is, again, Ty Dunn does an incredible job. Great story. Go check it out. Um, it, it's the, it's, to me, it's the motivation, right? Literally, the, one of these accounts posted yesterday that, like, Devin Allen, who went to Oregon, played for the Eagles for a little bit, is an Olympic hurdler. He's fantastic. Has already been in the Olympics once, but has dealt with like torn ACLs from football. Um, And the Olympic trials are going on right now in Eugene to determine who goes to the Olympics for the United States. And this one account said, oh, you know, Devin Allen's going, trying to be, he's competing in the 110 meters. He's going to try to get to the Olympics. Nick Sirianni says he hopes he gets it. Joey, he's not in the field. (laughs) He's not racing. He's still recovering from a torn ACL. It is Factually incorrect. I so I also recognize Joey. By the way, Danny's not here. He's playing in a softball tournament. So shout out to Danny. Hopefully he brings home that gold. Go get a kid. Um, That's why he's not here. Um, He'll be back on soon. Celebrity Danny. Celebrity Danny. Joey, I recognize that I'm biased in this scenario. That I'm I'm passionate about this because it bothers me. 
and it might not bother people the same way. But so I'm, I recognize that. But I, I don't know if that's if you're kind of like, yeah, it's no big deal. But it just frustrates me that it frustrates me that I get a text about from from buddies who don't cover or don't cover the Cowboys, aren't fans of the Cowboys saying like, dude, did you see that Mike McCarthy's fed up with Jerry Jones? <laughs> You know what I mean? Because that's all the information that gets that gets into the head of the national public. So that is the information. It doesn't matter that Ty Dunn Dun wrote 10,000 words. Instead, the one behind a you know, subscriber thing only. It matters that one aggregate account, who, by the way, we don't even know the identities of these people sometimes. That's the crazy part about them. And they've literally been sold off in these accounts and stuff. Crazy. Anyways. Yeah. yeah. No, it's... And I'm going back to the, the Oregon thing. How do you even get the Devin Allen thing mixed up. Like what made him think that he was running the hundred meter and doing all that stuff when it wasn't true. I do. So it's funny because then I Googled Devin Allen after this. Cause I wanted to, I tweeted in reply to this, like, by the way, you're incorrect. Here's for fans that are now in the comments. Here's the actual information. Um, I Googled Devin Allen in one of the most recent and like news. And one of the most recent stories was like from like 2021 or 2020 when he was preparing for the Olympics then saying like, he's going to run in the hurry trials and get ready for the Olympics. And it was, but it was like, that's one of the most recent stories, but also Yahoo, like Canada had like posted it from 2021 had posted it with a 2024 byline, even though it said it was from 2021. So I think literally like long story short, I think we have <laughs> unprofessional people being in charge of the news cycle now, in my opinion, with bad motivations. Hmm. I know the paywall it's the paywall stinks because obviously journalists need to get paid. Um, but at the same time, anyone sees like a, a little thing, it doesn't matter how much it is. And they're just like, Oh, whatever. I'll go try to find a free story that has the information. When obviously the free story is the watered down information. Like we've seen in this Mike McCarthy scenario. And I don't know how to fix it. I, I think it's probably unfixable. Um, the, that, that, that part of it in terms of, you know, like we're always going to have people that will find a way to do it cheaper, right? That's just business, right? It's like, hey, you know, if you want to take down one business, similar thing, and then you go undercut, you build a subscriber base, and then you charge, right? Like it's business 101. But with media and, and information, I think it's so much more vast, the discrepancy between, you know, paying for journalism, getting free journalism from people who steal basically content information and did, you know, do it themselves. And that's just the way it is. Cause we aggregate stuff all the time, right? If it's like, Oh, cause that's news now. Like it's just, it's tough. I, I think if the motivations are good, that's fine. And I think people just need to consider where they get their information from and who, what their motivation is. If you're getting it from one of these aggregate sites, just know people that their motivation is to truly get engagement for monetary purposes. It's not to give you the best information possible. So keep that in mind when you're retweeting, sharing, or even reading. Like, in my opinion, always be cynical, always double check information because one Google, like one Google thing, and that's actually the tough part about the Mike McCarthy thing. I'm rambling now, is that like it was behind a story from three weeks ago. So if you Google right now, Mike McCarthy fed up, Ty Dunn's story does not come up. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, even though that's where the original source of the information is. So. Yeah, that's the, that's the part that sinks the most. That he did all the did all the groundwork, did all the hard work, and he gets none of the the credit or any of the engagement that he probably should. That he definitely yeah, should. I mean, yeah, at least I mean, you tag him in a tweet, you know, credit him, I guess, whatever, right? But I don't know, man. It's it's a flawed flawed system. But overall, I don't think any Cowboy fan would be shocked to find out that Jer- Mike McCarthy might be a little fed up. <laughs> with his current situation or uncomfortable as he has said himself. So moving forward, Cowboys fans, in terms of this Mike McCarthy fed up story, just keep that in mind, right? If Mike McCarthy does really well, Joey, if they win a Super Bowl, he's not going anywhere, likely. (laughs) Unless he was like, you know what, now I'm going back to Pittsburgh. Tomlin just retired. You know I mean? Like, Mm. obviously that's a fake example. But, (laughs) um, But if Mike McCarthy does bad this season, he's not coming back. Everyone knows, I mean, like, it's not a, that's not a, that's not news, even though it's passed off as. So, anyways, Joey, tell me something good. I'm frustrated. <laughs> I need to cool down. Did you watch the bear at all? 
I've never seen an episode of The Bear. And mm. not because just do this, just haven't done it yet. I, I would like to, I just have not yet. 10 more episodes, aka season two, comes out tomorrow night. 9 ET, 8 CT, 6 PT for Danny. Give me your non spoiler p- elevator pitch about The Bear. Jeremy Allen White, who's great. He was in uh, Shameless. He was I feel in, like you got I a little Jeremy that. Allen White to you. I don't know. Me? Yeah. I I appreciate that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I've never I feel like if you grew your hair out like him, you could you could you could play a, you could be a chef in the bear. I don't have that I, when I grow my hair out though, it's not that like that curl that he gets. It's not as good. Okay. Anyways, so he's the chef that was at a Michelin star restaurant, like this really world renowned chef, basically. But then he comes home to his brother's restaurant in Chicago and it's really not doing well. And he tries to help rebuild it in essence. And it's just like a, it's a very gritty show, a lot of interesting characters. It's, it's good. It's very like, like real. It feels like in terms of the struggles that are going on and everything like that. Um, And the relationships are very like, like kind of remind you of some of your own, like maybe flawed family relationships that you might have, or that you've seen with, you know, throughout it's, it's good. It's very good. What a, what streaming service? Hulu. Hulu. Got you. I just started a uh, house of the dragon season mm-hmm. one. I've never, I hadn't seen it yet. So oh, another great one. I like, I think I like house of the dragon more than I do the bear, but they're both okay. Great. I'm, I, I finished episode two, um, and really enjoyed it. So, um, I think I was having a little game of Thrones hangover after the end of OG game of Thrones where I just didn't want to dive in yet, but I've seen too many people talking about it and I do, I did love game of Thrones for its entirety up until the ending. So, yeah, of course. This makes you want to watch, honestly, just makes you want to watch Game of Thrones again, just to like watch Daenerys and like pay attention more to the Targaryen history the Targaryen. stuff, because that's yeah. obviously what this is all about. Yeah, I uh, I also had such an urge the other day to watch the, um, spoiler alert for anyone in, who hasn't watched Game of Thrones, so fast forward like 30 seconds, um, the the, fin- the the one where they fight the, the White Walkers at the end. Yeah. Um, and that's all I'll say on it. And I just had that. I love that episode and it's so cool and the music and that scene where like they're all just drinking the night before, just like, all right, like probably the end of the world tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's just do it. <laughs> I just love it so much. The long um, night. That's what it's called. Yeah. Um, so good. Um, all right, Joey, let's talk a little more cowboy stuff For, before we do. Um, be sure to subscribe to this podcast, share it. We, any listen, any share, any retweet, any just telling of your friend helps so much. Any review helps so much. So please, please do that. It, it truly means a lot. Um, you could also sign up for our subtext, which is um, a way you can kind of get information directly to your phone and you can text right with us. Uh, if you it, basically, it's really cool. Like I, I like whenever Cowboys news happens, I'll text it to this group, to, to you guys directly with a little bit of thoughts of mine. Maybe sometimes I'll send a feature um, with a link there. Sometimes I'll send quite, you know, uh, questions to you guys. Um, I'll send news and what you can do, you can literally text back and then I could just text back directly with you. So it's like, I do a main broadcast text to everyone that subscribes, but then we could just text directly through subtext. So if you want to sign up, it's free. Just text 512-846-6377 and text Cowboys. That's 512-846-6377. Uh, also, check out Lone Star Live. We're, you know, columns, news, even in the slow period, real news and real, at least, information or discussion happens. That's not fake. So, or, mo- or, or through different motivations. Our motivation is to give you the best coverage of the Cowboys possible that we can. So, please check that out. Joey, my gears are so grinded. I got to, like... I got to talk about something else. So let's do that. Um, Joey, what should we talk about? Make or break. Let's, let's do it, man. Let's talk about which Cowboys this year have make or break seasons. And I think like, before we get into that, Joey, let's establish what make or break means, right? Because it can mean many different things in my opinion for many different people. So like for one person, it could be like, Ooh, this is their chance to like really make something of themselves. Right. Or for some person, it's like, hey, you're already on the edge. One more step in the wrong way, it could break. Um, or it could be somewhere, it's a spectrum in between for all these people. It just depends on who the character we're talking about is. 
So let's talk about a few of them. And the first one I want to talk about, Joey, is one Dakota Rain Prescott. And why would he be a make or break, Joey? Um, I don't know. Is is there a reason why Dak would be? I thought no. Honestly, so it's make or break, but like like we talked about on the last time we were talking about Mr. Prescott on our last podcast, what what would a one bad season really do for him? And I, I think that's such an interesting question moving forward. Like we talked about last pods, check that out, did a deep dive on it, but a little TLDR. The conclusion Joey and I came to is that <laughs> he would have to break. Like, like this season would have to go bad, like bad, 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 bad. And I, to a measure that I can't even really fathom, I'll be honest with you, for him not to cash in majorly in free agency whether next season, whether it's with the Cowboys or not. I agree. I think it's make or break year for him with the Cowboys, but I don't even know. Cause like he could do really well and move on. If he, if like maybe they make it to the divisional round and lose to the 49ers, that feels like a likely conclusion to this season. Um, <laughs> and, and Dak could look really good and it could be a uh, 34, 31 game that he played really well in. But you know, I mean, Dak stock shouldn't go down as like perception, public perception, but maybe he's just like, all right, yeah, Cowboys probably won't pay me. I'll go somewhere else. Yeah. I think it's more of a make. He has, it's less break, more make for Dak, because Mm -hmm. if he, in terms of both financially and just legacy wise, Dak Prescott's 30, he's turning 31 in a month. So right when training camp starts, that's, you're talking about prime of a QB career at that point for someone who will start their entire career, right? Which Dakota rain Prescott has proven to do so far. He has the chance from a legacy standpoint, in my opinion, to set himself up on a progressive path that can really eliminate a lot of public perception doubts about him. If he goes out and has another MVP runner-up type season, another all-pro season, another Pro Bowl season, you're talking about a guy with five Pro Bowls, a guy who's put together back-to-back seasons in, in, in terms of being probably his best self, right? Um, you're talking about a quarterback – we already talked about it. If he has another season like he did last season and he hits the open market, his market is $70 million likely per year, whether it's three years, you know, or I don't know. That seems like that feels like the likely destination for that. So I think from a legacy and monetary standpoint, this could be a make season for him. I agree with that. Cool. All right, moving on. How about one? Let's switch it up a little bit and go to someone who has a little more on the line, and that's Jalen Tolbert, who I if I think Jalen Tolbert even last season was a little underappreciated for what he did. If you look at his numbers, they're modest, right? I think he had, what, 28 catches, two touchdowns, like 250 yards, something like that. Nothing, nothing super spectacular. Um, but also, the Cowboys had this guy named CeeDee Lamb who probably caught a million balls last season. They had Jake Ferguson, they had Brandon Cooks. From a third receiver, they needed someone who could answer the call when called upon. They need someone who could block. And I think Jalen Tolbert, once he over, he, mind you, he didn't start off as the third receiver that year. It was Michael Gallup. He ended up overtaking him in terms of snap counts. And I thought Jalen Tolbert played very well when he was in. So I think the make or break thing, though, this season is, okay, Jalen Tolbert, rookie season, you did nothing. Second season, you took a step. Third season, it's time to take another step. It's time to actually become more of a threat in the offense. It's time to turn 28 catches into 45 or 50. It's time to it's time to make the Cowboys believe that they could let Brandon Cooks walk and have a cheaper option next season as their number two. So that's what you could make if you're Jalen Tolbert. If you take a step back, though, I mean, now you're talking about entering your fourth season, your final season with the Cowboys in terms of your rookie contract with a lot of doubts. To be, to be frank about what you can do. And that becomes even more of a make or break season next season. Full disclosure, I think Jalen Tolbert has won the ability, and I think he's got the confidence to take that next step this season. If I'm a betting man, I think he makes the most out of it, but he still needs to do it, and the onus is on him. Can I ask you something? Yes. <laughs> what do you think Jalen Tolbert's, say, hypothetically, CeeDee Lamb and Brandon Cooks don't get hurt. They're healthy the entire year. What do you see as Jalen Tolbert's ceiling for the season? Okay, let me do a quick little math because I think that is a good question, okay? 
So Dak Prescott last season had 410 completions, right? Okay. Let's just use 400 as a number. So how do you split up 400? Um, CD Lamb, what, 130? We'll say, we'll say CD Lamb healthy, 130 to 140, right? Mm. Okay. We'll say 130. Brandon Cooks healthy, let's say 60 to 70, right? Okay. Um, Jake Ferguson, healthy, 55 to 70. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I think that'd be a good Jake Ferguson season. So hypothetically, let's go 70, 70. That's 140, 130, 270. That's 130 other completions to dish around, right? And I think if you're Jalen Tolbert, you got to have 40 to 50 to have a quality third seat, to be a quality third receiver in this offense. And then you have 80 receptions to, you know, whether it's, Luke Schoonmaker, it's Rico Dowell and Zeke Elliott of the backfield. But that's actually a good point because it, Zeke Elliott sneaky has like 50 receptions a year. So anyways, I think if I think 40 to 50 is probably like, OK, Jalen Tolbert had a really good third season. I would agree. I think that is a ceiling year. But the reason I asked that is because, <clears throat> like you said, with CD Cooks and Ferguson are going to be the three guys. And like you said, Jalen Tolbert, if he can block and just do those little things and then step up in those small moments when he absolutely needs to, I think that's great. Um, the question comes in and is if he can really replace Cooks as that second guy next year, if he is that guy, if the Cowboys seem as that guy. But if he's just going to be the Cowboys, maybe the Cowboys sign him to a small deal and he's their version of like Juwan Jennings for the San Francisco 49ers, just that solid blocking receiver that can – do these make these plays sometimes? I mean, obviously, Juwan Jennings had a really good Super Bowl, so that's. But that's it's so funny you brought up Juwan Jennings because that's the guy I went to. Is when I thought when you said who a blocking third receiver who does who is well thought of, like people well you know think highly of him. That was the guy I went to. And you know how many receptions Juwan Jennings had last season in thirteen in thirteen games in the regular season? Well, I, I'm cheating because I just looked at it myself. Nineteen. Nineteen. So extrapolate that to a full season, 28 to 32. So maybe, honestly, maybe we're being a little bit too advantageous with 40 to 50. Hmm. I think he could have a good season. I think he could have a really highly thought of season if he had like 55 targets, 40 catches, 410 yards, four touchdowns. I think that'd be great. Yeah. So um, so maybe the make or break, though, I I think it's more about how it looks rather than the actual final product with, with Jalen Tolbert. Hmm. So. Yeah, no, I, I think he can definitely play his way out of um, a starting wide receiver on any team. If he doesn't play well this year, no team will see him as that. Maybe, you know, bring him along and in training camp is like a fourth or fifth option. But if he doesn't play well this year, then yeah, I think, I think he's looking at a much different career trajectory compared to if he, uh does it definitely feels like a, a sort of make or break for him yeah at least in like some regard um let's talk about a guy on the other end of the spectrum though in terms of his career trajectory that'd be brandon cooks who i have as one of my five make or break guys and uh, this is another one that's a little bit different right because there's a scenario where he plays really well and he's not on the cowboys next season right just because of money because of he's getting a little bit older you know he's i think brandon cooks is he 30 Let's see. How old is Brandon Cooks? He's only 30, by the way. Um, he's been for a guy that's been in the league as long as he has, I forgot, you know, it's he I think he must have started when he was 21 because he's he's been in the league for a while now. Um so Cro Cook, uh, you know, Brandon Cooks has the ability to go over 10,000 yards this season. Like that's impressive. I he, that means he's done it for his entire career, right? But if you look at the last two seasons, and again, last season I think he wasn't as healthy as maybe we all thought. Uh, obviously he missed the game in week two. Um, you know, maybe that lingered a little bit. Um, but he was kind of a slow starter with the Cowboys. Finished strong, though. Um, but it was, if you to look at yards and yards per catch, one of his worst seasons last season in total. So I think in terms of maybe not make or break on what he can do with the Cowboys moving forward, because I think that that's kind of, we'll see there. But I think it's a make or break for Brandon Cooks in terms of what he can do for the rest of his career. Um, I mean, is this a guy that ends up with 14,000 receiving yards and he continues to play for another six seasons and he has an 800 yard season every year moving forward. And that's kind of the guy he is. And I think that that's, I don't think that's unfathomable. And I think one thing he's trying to do is not only make a second con or make another contract 
with the Cowboys potentially, but with the rest of the NFL in terms of how much he might get paid. We're looking at a guy like right now, I think Stephon Gilmore is a kind of a good comp. Stephon Gilmore is a free agent, likely. You know, this is a thought, not a report. Because, one, he's probably waiting for a good situation, right? But also, if Stephon Gilmore, if someone offered him $15 million this season, he's probably going to go play for him, right? $10 million? You know, and I don't think that that's the going rate for Stephon Gilmore these days. So I think once you get older, it starts to come into a situation like, hey, are you worth the money you've always been worth? And I think that Brandon Cooks has a chance to, at the age of 30, and by the way, one of my big winners from OTAs and minicamps was Brandon Cooks because of how fast he looks and how explosive he looks. And he looks good. Can he continue that in the regular season? I think it could be not only eye-opening in terms of a make process for the Cowboys, but for other teams. So I'm doing some quick number crunching right now. Um, we're going to get you like a sound effect for like your number crunching. Like, like. <laughs> <laughs> so Cooks, obviously his biggest game last season was against the Giants when he had, what, 10 catches, 173 yards and a touchdown. Yeah. So I took the games before that and the games after that because it felt like that was the point when Cooks was more involved in the offense. I think in those, what was it, seven or eight games after, he averaged basically 40 yards a game, which is whatever, nothing eye-popping. But before that, he averaged like 23. And then there's also the, the difference in touchdowns. He had five touchdowns on the back half of that season compared to two before. So like you said with the injury thing, I think that is very – maybe maybe not very, but it – I feel like it's likely that he was dealing with something at the beginning of that season. Or maybe it was just also, it could be just slow start, new team, new quarterback, yeah. find your footing. All Very the time. But I think this year he will probably, I mean, not that he's going to have, maybe he will have another 173 yard game, but I think seeing him get around 40, 45 yards a game and like, I think eight touchdowns, 10 touchdowns is a very fair like thing for him. He, he had eight last year. And maybe there, maybe people will just think he that that was so much that he had five. I think he had three to end the year like in back to back to back games. Yeah, uh, final three games of the regular season, he had a touchdown. So yeah. that I mean, it's not like he's going to be scoring every game, but he could very well be a eight to ten touchdown guy for this team. And kind of just conversely, or in conjunction with what we just said previously about Jalen Tolbert, I mean. Maybe prove that, like, hey, this trio is what you want for at least for one more season, right? I don't know. But a lot, of, a lot can change after the season, as we've alluded to. So another make-or-break guy that, again, is, in, is more, it's more in the how can he make something versus break. I had Deron Bland, Joey. and Because all Deron Bland has done so far is be a freaking ball hawk. He has been a magnet. It, it's incredible. I, I mean... Because if you look at Deron Bland's stats, so 14 interceptions, right, in two seasons, um, which I don't even know where that lands in terms of, which would be kind of interesting, is how many other, I, I imagine that's near the top of most interceptions in two seasons. Um, his rookie season, he didn't really play much on defense until halfway through the season. He had eight starts and five interceptions. So basically, in, let's see, in 25 starts, the dude has 14 interceptions. Like, it's an, it's an incredible start, Joey. And this is why it's a make-or-break thing for me. And maybe I'm wrong. I very well could be wrong on this. But I think when you're a fifth-round pick, I mean, Brock Purdy, seventh-round pick, similar example, right? Where it's like, you know, is, is Brock Purdy the guy? He's played well, but I don't know. You know there's always this, like, I think you have to go above and beyond as a later round pick to prove that like, oh, this is not a fluke, right? Like, no, this is legit. And I believe it's legit with Deron Bland, right? But if he goes out and has, you know, no interceptions this season and like a top 80 PFF grade at corner, you know, people might, that doubt I think would creep in as like, oh, maybe he was a fifth round pick for a reason. Maybe, maybe the NFL figured him out. He couldn't respond, you know, and that's, that's the break trajectory, right? That's like the worst possible scenario for him, right? But, Joey, what if he goes out and has five to seven interceptions this season? And then all of a sudden, in three seasons, you're talking about a guy with 20-plus interceptions in three seasons going into the final year of his contract. Mind you, it's a four-year deal for a rookie, for a rookie fifth-round pick. 
that dude is going to get paid. <laughs> paid. <laughs> I mean, J.C. Jackson, Joey, proved it for one season and got paid, and then it obviously fell off very quickly. He did it for one season and got paid. Imagine what Jerron Bland at, at his age would get paid if he did it for three seasons, if it had become just a certainty. I just looked up when you <clears throat> mentioned it, how many are most interceptions through players first two seasons. Mm-hmm. If you get rid of all the people who played in like the fifties <laughs> in the sixties, like the night train lanes and <laughs> Don doll is number one. He had 23 interceptions through two, his first two seasons. Like, all right. Yeah. I, props to you, but we're going to go with uh, the modern era. Uh, three people have 14 interceptions through first their first two seasons, which is tied for the most among people who played in this century. Um, Bland, Marcus Peters, and Bland's teammate, Mr. Trayvon Diggs. Trayvon Diggs, yeah. And what happened to Trayvon Diggs? Got paid. He got paid. And got that paid. was as a second-round pick. Too. I mean, like, I, I mean, if Deron Bland has another five-plus interception season, Joey, we're talking about a guy who's going to probably get paid $20 million a year. <laughs> you know, we talk about contract. We talk about the cap <laughs> with the Cowboys. If if he, if he has another season like that, and we're talking Deron Bland extension next offseason, in addition to Micah Parsons uh, next season, in addition to new contract for Dak Prescott, like yeah. it, the, you know, it's the it's the blessing and the curse of drafting well, man. Honestly, like you draft well, mm-hmm. and but then you got to pay these guys eventually. And I don't know. Pardon me. Uh, again, we talked about this and. And I know the cap space can be manipulated, but I keep coming back to this idea like, man, that's a lot. I don't know. Maybe you just trade someone for assets when their market's hot. I don't know. So Maybe but, one of the two corners. Maybe. Um, yeah, but do you kind of agree with me that Jerome Blank could certify himself? and that, Or, you know, that there is still the little, like, oh, he's a fifth-round pick, and did you see what DK Metcalf did to him? Maybe that's yeah. replicatable? Like. No, I think I think that is so real this year where if he's getting cooked like he did against DK, obviously that was like a, a one game thing where it was like really bad. Of course. And he still had an interception game. that game too. <laughs> he did. I know. He came back with the interception. But they did have to move him off DK because they were just like, all right, yeah, you uh, you know, new assignment for the night. Um, <laughs> but he could be one of the, I think it's Jair Alexander. And Denzel Ward are the two cornerbacks yeah. making twenty million per year on average. Diggs is at nineteen point four. I think he'll be right in that range, and then I think that would give some serious questions for the Cowboys in terms of how they want to go about this roster management. But yeah, no, they would have two got two like absolute ball hawks at corners. But then again, like you said, it could go the other way, where it's just like, all right, this guy makes some plays, yes, but. It's it's inconsistent, and he makes as as many times as he make play, makes plays, he gets burned, which obviously is not a recipe for success entirely. It's a very risky proposition, so that could also mean he's maybe a ten to twelve million a year guy that you know makes those big plays, but he can't be relied upon as your shutdown corner. I mean, even Trayvon Diggs had that aura of like, oh, he's just a gambler, yeah. and he pays and it pays off. And ironically, I think. He looked – did he play one game or two last year? One. Diggs? Yeah. One, two, two, three. <laughs> what did they play the Cardinals? Two. He played two. Yeah. Uh, Trayvon Diggs through two weeks looked like the best version of Trayvon Diggs. You know what I mean? And I think that he was set to like – he was looking shut down. And like it was – I was very impressed with those two weeks. So, I mean, like it looked like once he got paid, he was – going to keep getting better and you know we'll see him again this season then but Deron Bland can certify himself as one of the best corners in the NFL this season or he can give way to more doubt for some for people who doubt him already if that makes sense all right let's go to my last make or break person and there's more but this we I limited it to five and Nishan Wright speaking of corners Nishan Wright is the one that I think has a lot to – we talk about guys who can really make the, it's something of himself. Um, I think Nishan is kind of more on like the uh, – you know, he, he has to avoid breaking <laughs> this season. Nishan Wright, former third-round pick um, in uh, the uh, 2021 draft. And I think one thing people got to remember about the 2021 draft 
that was the first draft after the COVID. There was the after the, the COVID season we had. So, Joey, can you name the top five picks from the 2021 draft? Just top five picks in general? Yeah. 2021 was now three years ago. Mm-hmm. So that's got to be – that's the T-Law draft, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's Trevor Lawrence. It's – oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> I, Jets, Jets at two. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson. No, I'm really blanking right now. Niners at three. Trey Lance. Trey Lance. And then four and five? Is that – was – Oh, forgive oh, me. I was thinking it's still huh? was four to the Texans, right? I, I think so. Now, hold on. I was thinking of top five QBs in that draft, but like oh, also top five quarterbacks. Yeah. Okay. I thought you were thinking of top five picks in general. Well, Kyle Pitts and Jamar Chase. Okay. So, okay. Jury's still out on Pitts just because, you know, mishandlement, likely. Um, and then Jamar Chase is Jamar Chase. But well, uh, top five QBs in the draft, I, I've always pointed to because. Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, and Mac Jones. Or Mac Jones and Justin Fields. Um, four of those five guys are backups on other teams. now. Um, so my, po- my point being, 2021, after the 2020 COVID season, talk to any NFL scout, they'll tell you it was a weird year. Hard to, hard to scout entirely, right? Because also the year before, it, anyways. So, Nishan Wright was part of that draft class. And if you look into Sean Wright, that's a guy who looks the part. Six foot four. He's so long, too. Um, he's, you know, he's coming. He's got one interception in his career so far. But they drafted a corner last season. And it's not unfathomable to draft corners every single season. But they drafted Eric Scott last season, who's also got to make himself on this roster. They drafted um, uh, Carry On. Uh, oh, Caitlin Carson. Caitlin Carson. So I was combining Gary On Conley with Caitlin Carson. Um, anyways. They drafted another guy in the fourth round. They brought in Gary on Conley, you know, former first round pick UFL played well in the UFL. There's going to be a lot of competition for Nishan Wright to make this team. And I think this is kind of the year like, Hey man, can you turn the potential into production? Can we trust you to, to be the other thing, Joey, the, Trayvon Diggs might not be healthy week one, right? Fully healthy. They might say, you know what? Let's ease him back in come out of torn ACL. We'll see. Right. That means that there might be a chance for another outside corner to start. So is that going to be Kalen Carson? Is that going to be Nashawn Wright? I think if you're Nashawn Wright, you got to go out and make it this offseason in this training camp and prove that you can be that guy. I, for Joe, for not Joey, Danny's sake, I'm really interested to see what Kalen Carson is all about. But yeah, it seems like they just have a lot of, or not a lot, but a few dart throws on the back end of that cornerback room, which... I mean, I totally get it. if you got Blandon Diggs, might as well take a couple dart throws and see what you got because you. Have and Jordan, I mean, Jordan Lewis is a very solid yes. slot. You know what I mean? So they got their trio is good, I think. But after that is a lot of like step up. And I think we're going to get to this eventually, but um, I think one of the things that will really play an impact into who makes the roster for cornerbacks is how important or how good impactful they can be on special teams because of how much how big that's going to be this year um yeah we can get to that more later yeah i think uh you know and so i did a 53 man roster projection i have him i have um nishan Wright making the roster but also i don't know if that that's that's the biggest maker i don't know if it's the biggest break from i think he may make, you know, I think he likely makes the roster, but then it's also like, hey, dude, this is a contract. He's going to be a free agent after the season. So in terms of your Cowboys tenure moving forward, this is make or break. And a lot of, dude, just so much potential when you're that, he just, he looks the part out there. And it's just a matter of, I think, putting it together. And also like one thing I think that gets underrated sometimes, Joey, is playing time, like in what that can do, like a lack of it. And I think it's only human, and I'm not saying this is the case with him, but I think, it's only human that maybe your confidence goes down a little bit. If you're not playing every day, your, your rhythm, your, you, you know, it just, it's hard to keep that going and to be the guy, the next man up, always ready. I think it's really difficult. Um, and I think it's something that doesn't, we underestimate how important that is for players to have and how hard it is for players to have. So long story short, I, I think maybe an important preseason for him 
maybe get some swagger, see how he plays, get some production going. Probably going to get a lot of reps. So, Can I give you two additional make or break yes. bets? Mm-hmm. So the one that really stuck out, stuck, I just said stuck, um, not a word. <laughs> the one that really stood out is Terrence Steele, the right tackle. Just because it's last awful. year he was – clearly the weak point of that offense. But McCarthy was saying throughout the year, like, you know, he came back from injury and uh, I don't even know necessarily what the injury was, but he was, he was basically defending him saying it takes a little bit to come back from that, that injury and recover and everything like that. So sure, whatever he gets the pass, even though it did not look that good. I think this year though, if that doesn't, if that continues, then they got to start, finding some real, you know, answers at that spot and probably replace him. If I mean, I don't know how, how long his contract is because I know he signed a, a fairly lucrative contract. Yeah, but it's one of those contracts that, like, that uh, you can get out of, right? Um, so, for example, uh, let's go to – let's. but also, so the thing about Terrence Steele, by the way, Joey, like that, he suffered a torn ACL in December of the year before, like, <laughs> and made it back. So – I mean, it makes sense that maybe there was a little bit, you know, um, a little bit of uh, rust there to kind of work out. So I think, but to your point, big season for him. I mean, his dead money, if they cut him after this season, would be $9 million next in 2025, $6 million in 2026, and 2027 would be $3 million dead cap. But you look at the cap savings, $8 million, $11 million, $17 million, $17.5 Long story short, you can get you can get out of that deal after this season. Um, so, to your point, I think you can make it, and you could be this the fixture at right tackle for a while, and you know validate the payday, or you could potentially get cut um, based on that money. I mean, just he got paid a lot, so when you get paid a lot, and there's avenues to get out of that, <laughs> it raises the stakes. So yeah. that's a good make or break. And then the other one. This is more on the make side than the break side. Rico Dowdle. What if he just has a really good year this year? Then he's the starting caliber running back and he'll get starting caliber running back money. But if he doesn't, and you know, if him and Zeke are just whatever, this kind of meh combo, then he'll just be known as kind of a, a lifelong backup type of guy, which of course plays into how Terrence Steele and the rest of the offensive line performs because if they perform bad, then he'll inevitably, inevitably not perform great and that will kind of, screw him over. But if Rico Dattle can prove himself and do well and be that kind of go-to, not necessarily a bell cow guy because we're getting away from that in this day and age of the NFL, but if he can be a go-to number one option on the Cowboys and do it well, then I think that's huge for his stock. The thing I keep coming back to with Rico Dattle is there's a reason why they stuck with him through multiple seasons of season ending injuries for a guy who was an undrafted free agent. He, they had so many chance. I wrote about this in my big feature on him last year. They had so many opportunities to just, all right, you know, we like him, but cut bait, the undrafted free agent, just let him walk. And they kept, they kept bringing him, they kept keeping him. And this year they brought him back, right? They had a chance to completely reset their running back room this season. Completely. Um, aside from Deuce Vaughn and, uh, you know, Snoop Connor and Malik Davis. Um, and now Nate Pete, um, but <laughs> they had a chance to completely reset. They could have done anything and they decided to go Zeke, Rico and Royce. And I think Roy Rico being the first of those signings is not by accident. So to your point, they like him a lot, especially this coaching staff. So can you make something with it? And I think he, last season was a big season for him because he proved he could be pretty healthy. He dealt with some injuries that he played through. I think maybe missed one or two games, but he proved that he could be pretty healthy. Can you be healthy the entire season and average four yards a carry just like you did last season? Could be a big season for him. I like that pick, Joey. Um, speaking of make or break, and this will be kind of our final segment, and we're not going to spend too much time on it, but the Cowboys signed two UFL guys um, a couple weeks ago, maybe last week. Uh, they signed Willie Harvey Jr., who, crazy enough, Joey, was at Iowa State when I was covering them in 2017. So just like a funny, like I found a video of, me interviewing him, and I'm just like, that's just, it's funny how seven years later, both in Dallas, Texas. Um, anyways, Willie Harvey was a standout. He played for the Browns for a while, was an undrafted guy, played for the Browns for a little bit. 
was a standout, I believe, for the Birmingham Stallions this off season or this UFL season. I, I think he was an all he was an all UFL player. Um, so they signed him, and then they also signed former first round pick Garon Conley, who has been out of the league for a little bit, um, went to the UFL and played well, and now has a chance to return to the NFL. Um, Garon Conley, twenty eight, mind you, he was twenty uh, fourth um, overall pick out of Ohio State in twenty seventeen. Played for the Raiders, um, then played for the Texans for two seasons, then a four-year gap before playing for the D.C. Defenders in the UFL this past season. So another guy with a very intriguing player. And he's a guy, Joey, I have on my 53, way too early 53-man roster projections making the team over Eric Scott, mind you, last year's sixth-round pick or fifth-round pick. So let's start with – let's just go with this question, Joey. In, in your opinion, what would Willie Harvey – and Gary on Conley have to do to make the team, to be the next UFL guys that stand out with the Cowboys. Remember, they have Kevontae Turpin, Brandon Aubrey. Could Willie Harvey and Gary on Conley be the next two? Funny enough, both of those guys in Brandon Aubrey and Kevontae Turpin are special teams specialists. I mean, obviously, Aubrey's the kicker. I think these two guys would need to show that they can have real value um, to John Fossil. Fossil? Is it Fossil or Fossil? Fossil. 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 In the special teams on this kickoff and kick return and whatever whatnot, because it's just going to be it's going to be so important this year, and I think it's a lot more important than most of the public really realizes. I think everyone knows the rule, but I don't know if it's sunk in yet. Just like how different it's going to look and going to be. I think, uh, dude, I I played a little bit of rugby in college, and like I just keep seeing rugby, like I and like I think it's sick. I'm really excited for it, and um. And I think, to be honest with you, like, I'm curious to see what kind of plays people run off it and what type of blocking schemes. Because when you're all lined up like that, <laughs> one hole, it's, you could be gone. Like, if you think about kickoff coverage now, you have not only the kicker back there, but you usually have another corner or safety, someone fast, who kind of plays this, like, safety valve position, which makes it hard to break kicks unless you're running away from them, right? So... I mean, I, I think it's going to be so important for guys that can not only be fast and play in space, but guys that can get off blocks and make tackles, which is why I think Willie Harvey, to your point, is, is a great candidate. Well, the one thing I would say to combat that is, could you envision the Cowboys taking five linebackers? Five seems like a lot. So I don't have him making the roster currently. Um, I have Kendricks, Clark, Overshone, and, and Leo Fow, right? So if he makes the roster, Joey, that means, in my opinion, they're cutting from somewhere else, whether that's safety, corner. I mean, maybe they go five wide receivers. Maybe maybe Royce Freeman's a surprise cut. You know, maybe three tight ends only. Uh, to your point, I almost feel like the numbers are against – the other one, like maybe C.J. Goodwin, like who's 34 now, maybe they say, you know what, like we love you. You've been a special teams ace for us for a while, but I think it's time to get a – faster younger special teams ace and, and willie harvey's our guy like that's his competition i think because i don't think i don't think it's apples to apples to compare him to liu fao and overshone i think that's fair and then with gary on conley i think he has a clearer shot of making it like you said because obviously he's on yours so you would agree but it just seems like those cornerbacks are more kind of jumbled up together at the the bottom half of that depth chart whereas those four linebackers are all making the roster. Like there's there's none of those guys that will not make that 53 man roster. Whereas Gary on Conley could sneak in. I mean, there's also a reason he was playing in the UFL, both of these guys, because you know, they just weren't like that. So I would I would honestly lean no for both of them. Um, but I think if it, either of them would, it would be Conley. Yeah, I think Conley, let's just lay it out this way. Who does Conley have to beat to make the roster? And I think Eric Scott, one of them. Um, I think Josh Butler, who was an undrafted guy last season, I, I think has played look good in OTAs. That's the guy that I kind of watch. He'd have to be Josh DeBerry, um, undrafted free agent this year, I believe, out of AM. Um, he has to beat Eric Scott. He might have to beat Nishan Wright. Like, <laughs> you know, and the thing though that's interesting about Conley with me is if you look at the Cowboys corner room, we talked about this, it's thin after the trio, right? And one of those guys in the trio is coming off a torn ACL. 
So in my opinion, you need outside corners that you can trust. Like guys that you're like, you know what? Like you're probably gonna have to play. So <laughs> we're going to need you, right? Um, or else we're in trouble. And maybe a guy that just finished playing, a guy who's coming off, a, literally just finished, the UFL just finished. Maybe there's like some like, you know, no slump. He just comes into training camp, like in rhythm, feels good. He's a former first round pick, so there's talent there, right? And maybe he's finally putting it together. I, I can just, I can visualize the situation where Gary on Conley makes his team. Like I can, I can see it. Obviously to your point, the onus is on him to go out and do it. But I think that there's an avenue and I think that there's reasons to believe that a guy like him could make the team. And full disclosure, I haven't done a deep dive on Gary on Conley film review, right? Not yet. <laughs> so I'm, I'm speaking on purely potential here. And I think that there's an avenue for Gary on Conley with context to make this team. Yeah, I completely agree with you. You know, what? like, it's crazy that it's been four years since he went four years without playing. I mean, like, I need to, I'm going to have to do a feature or something on this because, like, that's a long time, dude. <laughs> it is. I saw something that um, Gruden and the Raiders traded Conley to the Texans, and then it was, mm-hmm. like, five days after he was traded, they, like, burned one of the, Raiders receivers burn Conley on a route for like on a double move for a touchdown, basically. Yeah. It's just like, Ooh, ouch. But that was, that was also like four or five years ago, whatever it was. So, I mean, a player can obviously evolve in that time, but at the same time, there's a reason that these things have happened this way. Yeah. But I think like too, like, and I just kind of remember talking with like, like Noah Igbenogany about this, a guy who was a former first round pick too. Um, And to be honest with you, like, and this is just kind of, this is um, not verbatim. This is what's, a, I'm paraphrasing, but like, it's just like anything I think in life, man, if you're not, if you kind of don't come out of the gates in a new job, in a new, if you join a new softball team for Danny, like if, you know, it doesn't matter how you played before, but if you come out and you kind of struggle a little bit in the beginning, like that kind of weighs on you. Then you have this need to like, oh, I need to impress. I need to do this. Like, I always think of like with baseball, right? 162 games is a lot. There's a lot of at-bats in that point. There's a reason why players don't just, usually don't just stay hot the entire season. They ebb and flow. They go up and down. It's because I think, you know, same with golf. Like, the moment you start kind of struggling a little bit, there's always just a little inherent pressure. And then when there's pressure, your confidence isn't as stable as it once was. And that's what I think makes, like, Scotty Scheffler so great. He's a guy I don't think can be shook. There's, there's no shake in Scotty Scheff. So uh, I, I think that's I think it's just tough. And so maybe Gary on Conley just needed a break away. Maybe he, he, the confidence went low and I haven't talked to him or anything. Maybe the confidence went low and he got a break. Then he found some confidence in the UFL. You never know. You never know. Scotty Scheffler does throw a couple triple bogeys in. He's done that, I think, like twice in the past month. Obviously, he's head and shoulders above everyone else. But he does have those moments. He does have those moments where you can like see him visibly get frustrated. Yeah, and then but, and then what does he do at the end? Usually wins. So the thing I will say, I just think on top of adding to your point, these athletes are human. Like they're they're so much more human than I think people give them credit for a lot of the time because they just see them as these like superhero type players that do these spectacular things. And because they have all this money and all this fame and everything like that, they just it's whatever. They don't care about a thing. But that's just not how it goes. Like, I keep thinking of, like, Trey Lance, like, and I think just talking with him, he's a guy that's really, and I asked him this, like, you know, I asked him for a guy that likes to control what he can control. You've had so many uncontrollables between COVID, playing, you know, playing college and COVID, only so you only got one season as a starter, between breaking your leg, and between then having to watch Mr. Irrelevant just, like, take the reins, like, you know, which, like, I think, I think people are going to find out that Brock Purdy is really good. <laughs> you know, and I think what we're going to look back on in regards to, to that versus Trey Lance is like, okay, like, of course, the Niners went with something that had in their eyes had was a sure thing, right? Like, I don't know. I think we might look back on the Trey Lance experience in San Francisco and him being traded. And that's more of a reason of a guy emerging rather than an indictment against him. You know, I'm not, and I'm not saying that Brock Purdy, Tom Brady, but like with Drew Bledsoe, like was Drew Bledsoe bad? No, he got hurt. And then the goat appeared. Right. So 
you know, I, I, I think that's one thing I'm curious to see with the Trey Lance career. But he's a guy I think is so mentally strong. That I'm so curious to see how he actually performs this offseason and preseason because he looks very mentally strong when he honestly has a lot of reasons not to be. Okay, super quick. Rank the top three players you're most excited to watch for the Cowboys this preseason. Okay, just Trey Lance. Yeah, they do. Trey Lance, number one. I'm, v- I'm just very intrigued. Hmm. Um, uh, if he's healthy, Demar Vion overshone. Um, want to see if he can replicate what he did last preseason. Um, and I'll give a this is an honorable mention. Same with John Stevens, the tight end and slash wide receiver. I think he's a guy that can make the roster. Um. And then I think third, it's kind of tough because, like, I think we know what he can do already, but I want to see Kevontae Turbin in the new kickoff return. And I don't know how – this is the part – I don't even know if they're going to show their hand. Like, he might not even – he might take, like, one kickoff return and be like, all right, I got a feel for it. I'm good. Because um, they don't want to tip their hands on what they could do or what he what Kevontae could do in terms of that. Uh, but I'm just excited to see eventually what he can do in that ability because I think – I mean, I think he has the ability – to be really good. It, the fact if he, every time he touches the ball, I think he could go <laughs> realistically, whether it's a swing pass or a kickoff return or a punt return. If there's an Avenue, I think he's got a chance to take it. He's that talented. And it's so funny, Joey, because I swear to God, we always forget about him. I personally, like we're talking about receivers. Uh, literally I was doing my 53 man roster projection. And so what I did was I made an Excel sheet and I'm like, okay, QB and you know, how many spots, you know, wide receiver, blah, blah, blah. And I finalized it. I'm like, cool, I got my numbers. And Joey, I went to write the story and I get to receivers and I'm like, wait, I didn't put Kevontae Turpin in here. <laughs> <laughs> Literally forgot about him. So I um, had to make some roster shovels. But he's a guy we shouldn't forget about and it's criminal that I keep forgetting about him. I'm really excited to see the combination of Ryan Flournoy and Jalen Brooks. I want to see if either of them can do something like just stand out in any any sort of way. I'm also on the train of Trey Lance and then I think Overshone and then Sam Williams too. Just to kind of see That's like what that defensive line depth is really gonna look like. Or yeah. Well plot twist about the D line, it's not depth is not high right now. <laughs> um go check out Lone Star Live for more on that. Um I I, I still think they had a huge missed opportunity with Clayus Campbell. Um if you look at what they signed, the Dolphins signed for me, it was not much. I think that that would have helped a lot. But hey, who knows? We'll see. Um, Joey, we usually end sometimes, well, we kind of in fluctuate, but we end sometimes with what's on Danny's mind. I'm just curious. Do you have anything on your mind you'd like to end the podcast with? I opened this up with a huge rant. Um, just a, what would you call it, a monologue? Monologue, yeah. yeah. Do you have anything on your mind, Joey? Well, you're not caught up on House of the Dragon, so we can't talk about that. That's, that's definitely been... Uh... Something I've been thinking about a lot. I, Have they been um, doing it one episode at a time per week? Mm-hmm. Okay. I rewatched episode two, season two, episode two last night. One thing I need to do and go back is those middle episodes of season one because I watched the beginning episodes and the end episodes. Um, weirdly, it was a weird thing. Last week, I was going to try to catch up on the whole thing. Didn't. And that's just kind of how it happened. But there's some very important stuff that happens in those middle episodes of season one. I will say this. You are a Game of Thrones guy. I love Game of Thrones myself. I think game or season one of House of Dragon was better than season one of Game of Thrones. Yeah, I don't think season one of Game of Thrones was like that great, though. Fair enough. Season one of House of Dragons was pretty good. I hated the first episode. Why? There was a scene in there that just made me sad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I wasn't a big fan of the first episode. See, that second episode, I liked a lot more. Um, like, they introduced, like, a external threat in season two. I mean, episode two that, like, I don't know anything about it yet, but I was like, ooh, like, that's intriguing. Do you know who I'm talking about? The external threat. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, I, I was like, ooh, okay. Like, because I was kind of wondering where House of Dragons would even go. Anyways, um, I, I have one more thing before we head off. So, you didn't, you didn't go to their show, which I'm disappointed in you. But All Fantasy Everything is my favorite podcast. What they do is they fantasy draft like things in life. Um, it's a bunch of buddies who are comedians out of Portland originally and have kind of gone to different places, but so funny. Um, one thing they draft on their last podcast was food that you think you could win an eating contest in. 
So like, if it was an eating contest for this thing, you think you could win it. So putting you on the spot, Joey, what do you think, what food item on top of your head where you're like, you know what, if I was put in, if it's me and Joey Chestnut, if he's not, you know, if he's not canceled from the, that, con, uh, that, uh, um, from that competition, from the hot dog competition, <laughs> uh, what do you think you could, you could compete in? Well, I have a question. Is yeah. it timed, it, like say 10 minute timer? And yeah, just 10, minute, 10 minute timer. And not only do you have to like say, give me a food item, you got to guess how many, what you could eat in that 10 minute period. Okay. So my problem is I'm really fast at eating. I'm not much of a volume eater. Not saying I can't eat a good amount, but I just I normally, I normally don't. My specialty is in the fast stuff. So I'll say like soft, soft shell tacos is something I, I would feel really good about. Okay. When you say soft shell, are you talking like tortilla? Yeah. Okay. Why, it's not a shell though. It's a, it's a wrap. Well, it's what it's, it's so, soft taco. It's a soft taco. Okay. Soft taco. I'm sorry. There's hard I mean, and then there's soft. Like the, the shell is inherently hard, Joey. Whatever. I would feel <laughs> really good about those. Okay. I would. How many, how many could you do in 10 minutes? Like let's say Taco Bell. Well, cause like that size, like that, not that big. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. How many? Uh, see, I don't know what it, I don't, I can't gauge Taco Bell tacos cause I don't know what those are like. Because okay. So like, um, um, I don't know. Cause I can't, I, even know, go I, I know I would say it depends on how much, say it's just like meat and cheese. Yeah. Maybe lettuce or something like that. Yeah, I'll go meat, cheese and lettuce. I would say I could eat like 18, which isn't, it's not, not, not going to win That's, me. A I'm food. honestly kind of impressed. I'm kind of impressed. Not gonna win me a food competition, and I'm gonna feel like crap afterwards. But I think that would be my number. the The other thing I think I could do really well on is chicken nuggets. Okay, so do you want to know what the record is for uh, Taco Bell Taco Bell tacos? So that's kind of the size we're thinking of <laughs> in ten minutes. In ten minutes, and okay. you'll never guess who has this record. Oh, I'll like actually never guess, or is that no? You'll guess. You'll guess. Is it is it Joey Chestnut? It's Joey Chestnut. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> um. The record in 10 minutes is 52. Yeah, yeah, of course it is. That just seems wild. It, I mean, he's a wild guy. I'm excited for him against Kobayashi. That's going to be really exciting. On Netflix. That's going to be crazy. Netflix you know, live on the 4th of July. That's going to be crazy. Uh, uh, corny dogs could never. Um, do you want to know my pick? I have yeah. two. Let's hear okay. it. I have mini corn dogs. I think in... 10 minutes, I could eat a lot of mini corn dogs. And then um, this one's not, wouldn't be easy, but for some, I love them and I think I could do really well. Like a garlic knot. Like a, a, a like it'd be tough because it's so doughy. Yeah. But I think I could eat a crap ton of garlic knots. <laughs> you would need a lot of water or some sort of liquid to wash it down. I think in 10 minutes, I could eat 30 plus garlic knots. So what kind of garlic knots are we talking about? Like the Domino's garlic knots, like the little kind of. Yeah. Like that size. Little. Yeah. Like I think I could do 30. Okay. Okay. Which would be a lot. Um, how many mini corn dogs and how many are these mini corn dogs? So like the, like the mini frozen ones. Okay. Have you ever had like, have you seen those? They're, they're like, they're like this big. They're I've not, only had the regular size ones. I've never had the mini ones. Okay. Um, I think in 10 minutes I could do a hundred mini corn dogs. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> See, the thing with chicken nuggets for me, I'd got it like one night, one day I was really hungry and I got like that 50 piece from Wendy's, got all excited about it. Never thought I was going to eat the whole 50, but like I didn't even come close. Like I was also, I was eating other stuff too, but just the small stuff I think adds up quicker than we, quicker than we think. Yeah. So... <sighs> I'm trying to find, I don't think there's a mini corn dog record, but um, I think there's a guy ate 10 corn dogs in 77 seconds. Okay, well, that's just so. And I think there's about like four mini corn dogs in a corn dog. So 100, it seems a lot actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Maybe 75. Anyways, I think I do a lot. Um, that's a fun thing. Sub uh, subtext, everyone, text in what you think you could eat. <laughs> What your your you you would win an eating contest and maybe we'll talk about it on the next part. Ten minutes time, boom. Joey, any last thoughts? We kind of got to get going. So no. All right, man. Well, that was another episode of How About That Podcast. 
Thanks for listening to How About That Podcast. 